With the end of Ultimate's DLC nearing closer each day, an air of tension has settled over a fanbase lying anxiously in wait. With opinions split on who or what to expect, two prevailing theories have become most common. One expects the DLC team to go for broke with an absolute bombshell to finish Ultimate's roster with the mother of all exclamation points, while the other is convinced it'll be some first party character everyone sees coming who probably got thrown in as a cheap marketing ploy. The thing is, though, these late cycle reveals have actually been harder to nail down than you'd think. We've seen several curveballs before, or at least characters the community hadn't taken seriously. Stuff like making an old peripheral toy into a playable fighter, or building a whole moveset for a run-of-the-mill Mario enemy, or some weird kid with psychic powers from that RPG hardly anyone played. Even when a character was half expected, we've seen their designs go off in unexpected directions, like Lucario's aura manifesting as a comeback mechanic, or Byleth borrowing the signature weapons from the other house leaders. While we can look back at past examples and analyze how they happened, we also need to leave our options open to some extent, because you never quite know who might take you by surprise. This is Challenger Approaching, where we take a character who isn't playable in Smash yet and go deep into detail on what they could be like if they got in for real. Our challenger this time is uh, certainly unconventional, even by the standards of the series they come from. But with the circumstances we now find ourselves in, sometimes it pays to entertain a crazy idea and see where it goes. Kieran! Kirin is the player character from Nintendo's first-party mobile spin-off title, Fire Emblem Heroes. And if that series of words didn't scare you off already, let's continue. Dropped quite literally into the plot, Kirin is abruptly pulled out of their homeworld and into the fantastical Kingdom of Asker in the midst of an ongoing conflict, quickly tasked with protecting the sacred relic Bradablick from the forces of the invading Empire of Embla, lest their ruler find a way to tap into the artifact's power and use it to conquer all worlds. But things go a little off the rails when a surprise ambush causes Bradablick to activate in Kirin's hands and summon forth a being from another realm to defend them. Their destiny realized, Kirin is recruited into Asker's Order of Heroes with the all-important role of summoning more heroes from other worlds and the occasional antagonist to bolster the Order's ranks and give their new home a fighting chance. In the time since, the plots developed further, with Kirin and the Order coming to the aid of other realms in crisis, opposing multiple mad gods, performing tasks and side quests for the Askren people that help the Order's members grow closer as comrades in arms, participating in the occasional goofy seasonal event, you name it. Needless to say, this is a very weird setup by first party standards. Fire Emblem Heroes puts its own spin on the series' tactical RPG gameplay, with a focus on summoning and recruiting an ever-growing roster of playable characters from across Fire Emblem's entire 30-year history, something it's done well enough to sit comfortably as Nintendo's second most successful mobile game behind only Pokemon Go. And Kirin in particular is also highly unusual for a Fire Emblem protagonist. We've had Avatar characters before, but Kirin is designed to literally be a stand-in for the player. The world they come from is even heavily implied to be our own. A character whose main ability is summoning other characters is something we've never seen in Smash before. But they are also able to defend themselves. An in-game update earlier this year allowed Kirin to actively participate in combat in a specific mode, wielding Bradablick itself as a weapon that fires shots of non-elemental magic. Then another update gave Bradablick the ability to transform into a sword, lance, or axe. There's some legitimate potential here. With all that in mind, do I think Kirin has a serious chance to be DLC fighter number 11? No, probably not. We already got a Fire Emblem newcomer in the first round of DLC, and another would seriously be pushing the envelope. And a character from a spin-off title? One for mobile devices, no less, whose game is built around inherently controversial free-to-play gotcha mechanics? I wouldn't count on it, and it will be painfully obvious who in the comments watched this far and who did not. But with Ultimate's DLC near its end, I want to give a look towards some characters that might get glossed over normally, but could definitely stand out as playable fighters. This just happens to be one of them. So bear with me here, let's entertain this idea for now. What would Kirin be like in Smash? The summoner's basic appearance requires some explanation. While Kirin's default look has their hood up to conceal their face so players can imagine whatever they want, the update that made them playable also added options to customize their appearance. This actually works really well for giving us a varied set of alternate costumes in Smash. 
I'd personally handle it by splitting the alts into four male and four female like the other Avatar characters, having the default male and female costumes keep the hood up, then take three of each of the available custom designs, retool them a little so they're all the same size, and voila! But we also need a set of alternate palettes, which we have several good options for thanks to the other major factions that the Order of Heroes has fought with or against so far. The default design already uses the colors of the Kingdom of Asker, but there's also the Dark Forces of Embla, the Icy Realm of Niffle, the Fiery Hellscapes of Muspel, the Dream and Nightmare Worlds of the Leosophar and Dokofar, the Dwarven Magitek of Nithavalir, and even the Land of the Dead, and that's not even all of them. Despite having such a crucial role in the Order, Kieran's been more of a commander and not a frontline fighter until recently. This could show up in their animations, lacking the highly trained and precise movements of their counterparts. Unsteady jumps, a frantic run animation where they're just kind of rushing forward, stuff like that. It also helped them look distinct next to the other Fire Emblem character we have wearing a similar getup. If they wanted to help Kirin stand out even better, they could make them ambidextrous, swapping Bradablick between hands based on whatever works best for each given attack. It's a bit of a creative liberty, but it takes advantage of Kirin being such a blank slate, and it's something we haven't seen a weapon user do in Smash before. Now for Kirin's stats and other attributes. What could we expect from a character like this? Detailing their playstyle is kind of weird because it's built around something we'll cover in a later section. The best I can explain right now is it revolves around dynamic elements that change mid-match and require adaptation on the part of anyone playing as and against them. While we've had other fighters with this kind of dynamic gameplay, both on the actual roster and in this video series, Kirin is different than most of them because you don't have total control over these factors. Mastering the moveset would require understanding how to play around whatever hand you're dealt. Though no matter how those dynamic elements play out, it is guided by a consistent theme of stage control. Kirin has multiple ways to lock down sections of the playing field and limit where opponents can safely move around. Use them well, and you can restrict your enemy's actions, handcuff their options in neutral situations, and force them to find answers to you. Kirin's exact stats and details use a combination of their cannon stat line and some, uh, extrapolating, let's call it. Their typical humanoid build gives them above average size in a game with several cartoonier characters. I'd avoid making them the same height as Robin to further differentiate the two visually, and maybe slightly taller. Kieran's below average weight comes from them being less armored and less accustomed to direct combat compared to most other Fire Emblem leads, and also because their cannon stat line has below average defenses. Though I diverted a little from canon for Kieran's mobility stats, taking the whole not used to fighting thing and translating it to them not being very fast at getting around. Their walk, initial dash, and full run are all among the back one-third to one-fourth of the current roster, a far cry from their above-average speed stat in Heroes. But it is still faster than Robin or Byleth due to them not lagging around a ton of equipment or multiple particularly heavy legendary weapons. The aforementioned frantic sprint for their run animation also helps. Their airspeed and fall speed, though, are merely below average, and their recovery is actually quite good when they have the elbow room to set it up. Despite still getting the hang of combat, Kirin is wielding an ancient and powerful weapon attuned to specifically them. This gives their attacks that utilize it pretty good damage output with some legitimate knockout power. Their combo roots are limited and their attacks on the whole are pretty sluggish with only a few exceptions, focusing more on outranging opponents instead of outmashing them. But there are other ways to make Kirin's offense truly shine if things work in your favor. We'll get to how that works later on, though you might have an idea of where I'm going with this already. Next, we have Kirin's actual moveset. Let's take that potential we alluded to and put it to use. And we start with the most basic attacks. Kirin's jab combo consists of a quick punch using their free hand, then a forward elbow with the hand holding Bradablick, then finishes by holding the relic forward and firing a small shot of magic from it. The combo combines above average speed for a weapon user with solid damage. The last hit reaches further than usual for a jab finisher and has the properties of a projectile. Kirin's forward tilt has them quickly aim Bradablick ahead and loose a point-blank circular blast of magic with no movement on it. It's kinda slow for a tilt, but its hitbox is big, disjointed, and fairly powerful. At higher percents, you can rely on this for KOing opponents who miss space attacks. Kirin's up tilt taps into Bradablick's transformation abilities by shifting it into sword form and swinging it overhead from front to back. It's a fairly standard sword up tilt with range comparable to Roy and Krom, able to combo into a couple aerials at lower percents, but after that it's just a solid anti-air move. 
Their down tilt uses a different weapon type, turning Bradablick into an axe and performing a quick horizontal chop at ground level. Surprisingly good attack speed makes it one of Kieran's best scouting options close up, but with less damage and range than Bradablick's other modes, it has its own downsides. And while it doesn't combo into anything, the low angle on its knockback can force tech situations from mid percents onward. Then Kieran's dash attack has him transform Bradablick into a lance and perform a lunging stab. It's perfect for catching landings and punishing particularly laggy attacks. But its sour spot isn't as strong, and it's pretty slow to come out by dash attack standards. That's the basic stuff down, so let's really show what this most unusual of weapons can do. Kieran's forward smash shifts Bradablick into sword form, infuses it with magic that sets it on fire, then levitates it out of their hands as they direct it to perform a hands-free spinning overhead slash. Not only does it have added power and range thanks to the extra magic at play, Kieran even takes a step forward during its windup to give it some burst movement, though it's also notably slow to come out, so save it for when the time is right. Kieran's up smash keeps the train going by infusing Bradablick's lance form with lightning magic and performing a series of three quick stabs, up and forward, then up and backward, then levitating it for a final thrust straight up. Not only does it have impressive range, we're talking beyond Shulk up smash reach on the last part. Each of the first two hits links into the following ones, ensuring that final sweet spot will hurt. Though it's almost entirely vertical hitboxes and long, easily punished animation make it trickier to use than it sounds. Rounding out the set, Kieran's down smash uses Bradablick's axe form, enhances it with wind magic, floats it out of Kieran's hands, and slams it down in front and then behind them with blinding speed. Unusually fast for a move of its size, it's Kieran's most useful smash attack and excels at catching people who roll excessively. But just like with their down tilt, its damage and knockback aren't that great for a smash attack. Even at the ledge, it won't kill until past 100%. That covers the ground, so how about Kieran's aerials next? Their neutral air has them generate a ball of magic at Bradablick's muzzle and swing the relic around in a circle, which is similar to a few other neutral airs, but it does have a unique animation, starting immediately in front of Kieran and going 360 degrees around clockwise. Takes about 10 frames to come out, has a sweet spot on the magic and a sour spot on Bradablick and Kieran's forearm, and its knockback pushes people away instead of starting combos, which still helps give you stage control. Kieran's forward air uses Bradablick's sword form, levitating it out of their hand and swinging it in an upward arc. It's actually Kieran's slowest aerial, but the hands-free animation gives it range on par with Cloud's forward air, making it an important spacing tool in neutral that excels at catching people jumping in at you. Kieran's back air levitates Bradablick's axe form behind their back to perform a downward chop as they turn back around to retrieve it. Like you probably guessed, this is Kieran's fastest aerial, giving them an alternate spacing tool with better frame data but less damage and range. Its knockback is weak enough at low percents to combo it into a couple things if you're on the ball. Then Kieran's up air lifts Bradablick's lance form above them and twirls it overhead. With two long-lasting hits and great horizontal reach, this thing's really good at juggling people and pressuring platforms. However, it also has a lot of end lag, so if you swing and miss, then opponents have a chance to get around you and land. Finishing the set, Kieran's down air keeps Bradablick in its default form, pointing it downward and firing a burst of magic at their feet. Doing this actually stalls Kieran's descent for a moment as the attack comes out, giving them access to Lucario-esque movement mix-ups to aid in landing or recovering. The blast itself is a little smaller than the one from their forward tilt, though still decently sized, deals moderate damage, and is unable to spike. Kieran's grab game starts out pretty simple, with grab animations that simply reach forward using their free hand. Can't get too crazy all the time. Their pummel uses Bradablick as a blunt object and whacks the opponent with it. But Kieran's throws are where this gets interesting again. Their forward throw lobs the opponent forward, holds Bradablick's lance form in both hands, and swings it like a bat. Something Kieran remembers from their home realm that they adapted to combat, perhaps? Their back throw has them briefly charge Bradablick, turn around, bringing the opponent with them, and fire a point-blank magic blast right in the enemy's chest. This one's their kill throw, and it's a pretty strong one. Then Kieran's up throw is a quick, hands-free uppercut with Bradablick's axe form, a very useful combo throw that leads into stuff up through 70%. Could see up throw to up air being a staple. Then their down throw morphs Bradablick into sword form and slams it down on the opponent from above. Kieran's highest damaging throw at 11.5%. Finally, a few taunts. 
such as one where they perform a quick post-combat flourish with Bradablick's default form. Is it really Fire Emblem unless you spin your weapon around after you defeat someone? One where they suspend Bradablick in midair and quickly shift it between its forms. And one where they rummage through an unseen pocket on their outfit, pull out an orb, bundle of hero feathers, refining stone, heroic grail, or trait fruit, look over the item for a moment, then put it back away. So, Kirin's specials function differently than usual, and it's because they revolve around a unique mechanic. And if you've played Fire Emblem Heroes for any significant amount of time, you've probably put two and two together. Well, of course, what's a summoner without the ability to do exactly that? Kirin specials call forth some of the many characters from Fire Emblem's 16 titles and counting to perform an attack or other technique. Each special has its own pool of available units, seven apiece for the neutral, forward, and down specials, four for the up special, that is chosen at random each time their corresponding move is used. Units are also assigned a star rating, three, four, or five stars, based on their rarity and effectiveness. Your odds of summoning any unit of a given star rating remains the same for all specials. Summons are a key part of Kirin's moveset, but there are limitations that must be kept in mind. Summon units perform one specific action and leave from once they came immediately afterward. And once they've appeared, Kirin can freely move around and perform any regular action, except another special. Only one summoned unit can be in play at a time. You can press the B button while a summon is out to dismiss them ahead of time, but doing so ends any attacks or beneficial effects they've done, and you're still stuck waiting for about half a second before you can perform another summon, which Kirin players would need to keep in mind if they were sent off stage. Since you have to go through a summoning animation every time, all of Kirin's specials have substantial startup that makes them difficult to use in close quarters. You'll want to have space for these. And to make it clear what type of unit is about to show up, Kirin takes a different pose for each special as they're about to perform the summon. Got all that? Then let's get summoning. Kirin's neutral special lets them call upon the simplest of the bunch. Heroes who wield a sword, lance, or axe. The following seven units are available for this special. Lon Ku performs two quick slashes, downward then upward, as if doing a double attack on an opponent he significantly outspeeds. Ferdinand replicates the combat art Tempest Lance by winding up and performing a wide rising swing with his weapon. Worth mentioning that despite what their hero's sprite work might show, all units summoned in this moveset, other than certain exceptions we'll get to later, will appear on foot. Bartra takes his trusty giant warhammer, heaves it over his head, and slams it down in front of him. It's like a variant of Hero's Hatchet Man with less damage but a quicker swing, and it does do a number on enemy shields. Ira performs her signature technique, Astra, letting loose with a lightning-fast flurry of five sword slashes. Nephany puts her halberdier experience to use, stepping forward with a shield bash that blocks enemy attacks or projectiles, and following it with a swing of her lance. Hector performs a variant of his critical hit animation from his original game, an advancing rising axe swing to pull opponents above him, a rapid spin of his axe above his head for multiple hits, then a powerful back-to-front overhead swing to finish. Finally, Ephraim readies himself for a moment, then charges forward half a stage length with his lance pointed straight ahead. This move crosses through opposing shields, letting him hit multiple enemies at a time, and deals so much shield stun that anyone struck by it has no chance to retaliate. While these seven perform a wide variety of attacks with different strengths, they all serve the same general purpose, controlling the area immediately ahead and forcing opponents sitting at mid-range to play around them. That's a key detail. Each special has a specific role in mind you can count on it to perform no matter who gets summoned, but you still have to adapt around exactly who shows up and how they perform that role. It's also worth remembering the lengthy summoning animation at the start. Go for this when you think mid-range control is about to be important. And that's just one move. Kirin's side special summons a whole different set for a whole different purpose. When you need to hit something further away, send in the tomes. Available through this move are the following seven magic users. Merrick casts the wind spell Rex Calibur, conjuring a powerful cyclone on a location a distance ahead. It uses its animation from Fire Emblem Awakening specifically. Lelina casts the fire spell Bolganone, summoning a plume of flame and lava on a distant location that deals multiple hits instead of one big one. Like with Rex Calibur, it uses its animation from Awakening. Odin uses the hero's exclusive spell Blarblade, forming magic above the target into the shape of blue crystalline swords and sending them plummeting down with an overly dramatic wave of his hand. 
Reinhardt makes his presence known with his signature tone, Dire Thunder, striking the targeted area with two huge bolts of lightning. The second bolt comes quickly enough for the first to combo into it. Lysithia uses the unusual spell Dark Spikes Tau, unleashing a wave of shadowy spikes that travel straight forward a long distance. Since this magic moves along the ground, it's great at catching opponents trying to run in, mirroring its effectiveness against cavalry units in its game of origin. Celica performs her signature spell Ragnarok, concentrating three circles of flames around the target area, one right on it and the other two in front and behind, and converges the flames together for a chain of three fiery blasts. The first two hits deal enough shield damage to ensure the third will poke through. Finally, Julia taps into the Sacred Book of Naga, summoning an apparition of the Divine Dragon that unleashes a massive explosion of light. Despite the wide array of magic on offer here, these seven all play the role of applying pressure to opponents a distance away and making attempts to camp you out much more difficult. This forces people to deal with you more directly instead of running away, giving Kieran legit counterplay to something many slower characters can struggle against. That said, this move is far too committal to camp with yourself, and if opponents close the distance fast enough and you don't pull Lysithia, you'll be left relying on your own attacks. Next, we have Kieran's recovery move. Who do they summon to help get back to the stage? Exactly who you'd expect. These four heroes who fight using flying mounts offer Kieran a ride as they attack. Sita directs her Pegasus to charge ahead in whichever direction you hold. Lance pointed forward to stab anyone in the way. I realize her hero's sprite here has a sword, but she's more known for using lances and that's what I'd give her here. Camilla comes with a slower but bulkier flying wyvern. While she doesn't travel as quickly as Sita's Pegasus, the two swings of her axe she performs during it have wider hitboxes. Tana takes Sita's techniques and further refines them, flying a greater distance, about 50% further, and dealing greater damage to anyone in the way. Finally, Alincia tops them all by performing two separate charges in quick succession with a sword slash accompanying each. And just like Pikachu's quick attack, the second part can be aimed in a different direction than the first. This set is more straightforward, and for good reason. Recovering off stage is kind of important. Sita and Camilla go an above average distance recovery wise, while Tana and Alincia go legitimately far if they show up. So if you're deep off stage without your double jump, you still have roughly a 40% chance of making it back. While Kirin still has an active hurt box mid flight, the summon units do not, and their attacks hitboxes can block stuff your opponents throw out. You're even able to grab the ledge from around the halfway point onward. That said, even though this move's summoning animation is quicker than Kirin's other specials, it still has so much startup that you wouldn't be able to pull it out if someone's right in your face. So that's melee weapons, magic, and flyers, so who could show up for Kirin's down special? Well, this is where it gets even crazier. These seven heroes all offer some kind of supportive effect. Reese uses a simple staff to recover 10% worth of damage, as long as you can stay close by him long enough for the healing magic to kick in. Nils performs a tune on his flute empowered by a family keepsake, enchanting Kirin with a protective spell that temporarily reduces the damage they take. Knockback is unaffected. Nana uses a different type of staff that holds restorative magic. While she only heals 7%, she also cures any status ailments you might happen to be afflicted with. Raisin performs a sacred melody of the Heron Clan that invigorates the listener. Here that gets interpreted as a temporary buff to Kirin's mobility, something very useful for a character who isn't that fast normally. Silk uses a hero's exclusive ability, a staff enchanted with an elemental bomb that heals 5% damage and temporarily raises Kirin's offensive and defensive abilities, if you can stay close by for long enough. Azura uses her ultimate skill from her game, remaining in place for about 15 seconds while singing a melody that releases a pacifying aura on the area around her. Any damage Kirin takes while within that aura is significantly reduced. Finally, Morgan encourages the summoner with the ultimate assist skill, Rally Spectrum. If Kirin remains close by for long enough, their offense, defense, and mobility are all temporarily buffed. The male or female versions of Morgan are chosen at random, and the effect is the same either way. Summoning support gives Kirin a grab bag of utility moves to fall back on and help offset their normally underwhelming stats. If you have a break in the action, or want another way to force opponents to approach, pull for some help and see who shows up. That said, any buffs you get from this move do not stack. In fact, summoning another support unit actually cancels any buffs from a prior one immediately. You're best off making the most of what you get. 
All that's left is Kieran's final smash. While we've tapped into many of the heroes that are able to fight alongside, we've yet to include their closest companions. But that's because I saved him for last. And now, it's their time to shine. Kieran begins by channeling the Smash Ball's energy into Bradablick and firing a huge blast of magic directly ahead. Anyone caught in the explosion is sent flying upward, triggering the rest of the final smash in the same way as Ikes or Clouds. A portal appears above the stage and behind the helpless foes, through which Alphonse, Shirena, and Anna appear with their weapons drawn. Kieran rises up to join them, and the team of four begin a no-holds-barred assault. This ultimate barrage comes to a head as the quartet gather above the enemies, channel everything they have into their weapons, and deliver a decisive final blow. This is what Kirin could be like in Smash. A stranger pulled into a multiverse-spanning conflict whose attunement to a most unusual weapon gave them the power to summon a means to fight back. Though inexperienced in combat they may be, their growing knowledge of the relic they wield and the many allies at their beck and call give them something no one else can truly match. With a moveset geared for exerting control, Kieran excels at screwing up opponents' game plans and setting up advantageous situations. Exceptional reach on most of their attacks allows them to wage spacing wars against most of the roster and come out on top and the heroes they summon offer a wide range of useful abilities and beneficial effects, any of which can be used to gain or maintain the upper hand. However, Kieran needs breathing room to get going, which is hard to do against aggressive opponents they can't manage to shake off. Their lackluster frame data means they have to be careful in straight fights and use their range to their utmost advantage, and the inherent reliance on random chance for all of their specials means their players cannot count on any one unit appearing at a given time, instead having to accept what they get and adapt around it. Full disclosure, I mostly just wanted to have some fun with this one. I know full well how unlikely Kieran's chances are, and I highly doubt we'll get another Fire Emblem newcomer until the next Smash game. But the Heroes update that made Kieran playable gave me a spark of inspiration that I wanted to make something out of. It also let me take a crack at the summoner archetype that gets brought up sometimes. As you'd expect, there were a few ideas that didn't make the cut, mostly characters I considered for the specials who got scrapped for one reason or another. I tried to have the list of summons pull as equally from as many of Fire Emblem's different worlds as I could get. Whether I succeeded or not is for you to decide. Talking last-minute surprise newcomers can be difficult. While we've been caught off guard many times before, in no small part to how bad of tunnel vision the community gets, it doesn't mean literally anyone is possible. We want to keep our options open, yet still be informed by what we've learned from before. Hopefully this challenger was one example of what interesting stuff you can find with just a little searching. Special thanks for this video to these people here. Extra thanks for my patrons for their continued support. Practically an A support for some of you guys by this point. So, until next time, I need to start saving up orbs. Choose Your Legends is just a month away.